Hello everyone, this is Grandmaster Pascal Charbonneau and this is day five of the Chessable Masters by Chess24. The first day of quarterfinals action, we saw Yam Nepomneshi take on Vlad Artemiev and today's game of the day features a game from this match. We also had Magnus Carlsen facing off against Fabiano Caruana, the two highest rated players in the world. Uh, but this matchup between the two Russians, Yann Nepomneshi and Artemiev, is a very interesting matchup. Uh, a matchup of young players who are both very experienced playing online chess. They're both extremely good in rapid uh, time controls, uh, and it was uh, bound to be an exciting match. So um, this is this is the first game of the match, the game that kind of set the tone for, for, for this battle. And it starts with e4. Jan uh, fairly, you know, fairly faithfully uh, plays e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5. So we have a Rai Lopez. And Artemiev is one of those players who has kind of a shifty opening repertoire. He plays mostly sidelines. He tries to get, he's one of those guys who's, he's not playing sidelines to get off the beaten track positions. He just seems to want to avoid the major theory. And so here, this is no exception. He plays g6, which is, um, which is an interesting move. And, and I think as we get to the position that they reach here uh, on this move, I'd like to show you, you know, if you play sort of the normal, uh, instead of g6, if you play the normal Rai Lopez, the classical variations with a6, bishop a4, knight f6, uh, castles, bishop e7, rook e1, b5, bishop b3, d6. So when you get to these positions, white plays c3, you know, eventually white plays d4, h3, and, um, one variation in particular that was very popular and played among others by Magnus Carlsen is the Briar variation, where after castles, black plays knight b8, knight d7. And in those variations, very often black will end up putting their rook on e8 and then bring the bishop back to g7. So when you look at the move g6 on move three, it's actually a fairly ambitious move because ideally black would like to get the same kind of position where they get their bishop to g7 in one move one tempo while in some of these other variations the bishop comes back that way um and so it spends actually three three tempos getting there so that's sort of the idea of this variation of course not everything is perfect and it will see um one of the drawbacks of it is that white is able to play d4 in one go with no pressure and immediately creating threats like d5 so um, but the play is fairly normal here. They develop their pieces. This has been played before. If you follow, if you like to see when do players deviate so far, they've, they, they're, they're following some other grandmaster games that have been played in the past. Knight D2, Rook E8. And now white makes an interesting decision. It's always, it's always tricky in the Rai Lopez. There's a lot of options, um, whether to close the center as Jan does in this game here, play D5 or keep it open. Uh, but if he wants to keep it open here, the tricky part is that with the rook on e8, black, if you, you can't play, for example, the move knight f1, which is a typical Rai Lopez move, if you play knight f1 here, then black can play e takes d4, and they have two pieces here attacking e4 while there's only one defender. So you can't play knight f1, and so for that reason, if you actually want to, um, to keep the center fluid here, to keep the option, then you would probably make a move like bishop c2, um, and play knight f1, knight g3. Now, it's interesting to know that the bishop has had to move even though black hasn't played b5, which also gives black a little bit of extra flexibility. So it's an interesting it's an interesting position. Jan decides to play d5. The knight goes back to e7. And then he plays bishop c2. Again, this is an interesting decision. It's also possible to take, and these positions are very, very much playable. One of the things here is that white usually will play c4. And after they play c4, it's quite obvious that white would like to be able to put their knight on c3 but here they've already played knight to d2 so if that was the plan that he wanted to go for you could argue that he should have played d5 when his knight was still on b1 so it makes sense that jan decides to keep the bishops he plays bishop to c2 bishop h6 so again an interesting decision by artemiev it's a logical positional decision to to say okay my my bishop is the my light squared bishop is the better one of the two bishops because uh, my pawns in the center are on the dark squares here, sorry, and white's pawns are on the light square. So this bishop, you know, arguably is, a, is the stronger one. Um, so, however, the, the, the issue with playing bishop h6, as you'll notice, is that this bishop was very close to the king. And so these dark squares around the king will be weaker after you trade it. So it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting positional decision, slightly risky. It also takes time, right? So if you wanted to drum up some counterplay with, for example, c6, try to bust open this 
pawn center uh, by playing c6, you might have wanted to do it, you know, without wasting so much time. So um, Jan plays knight f1, says, you know, if you want to trade that bishop, fine. Uh, and the knight is rerouted to the king side as it so often is in Ray Lopez. Bishop c1, queen c1. He takes with the queen because he wants to have at least the idea of playing queen h6. Whether that's an effective threat right away, uh, maybe. And that's why, you know, Artemiev plays king g7, stopping queen h6. Knight g3, a5. C4, queen to b8. It was also possible to play. So Artemiev goes for this maneuver here, which is an interesting maneuver, gets his queen into play. Uh, but you do wonder whether it might have been possible to play c6 right away. And then usually the plan is going to be to take at some point and play something like b5, b4 and start grabbing space. Maybe the queen can come to b6. He decides to first bring the queen out. Um, and it's, you know, in, in hindsight, maybe that was... Not quite as good. It feels like the queen becomes a target here. So Jan plays a very logical plan here. He starts with b3. And the idea of b3 is that he sees that the queen is coming to a7, potentially to c5. And he wants to prepare playing a3 and b4. Now, this is instructive. If you haven't seen the structure before, you don't want to play a3 because that would allow a4. And now you're kind of stuck. Whenever you try to play b4, the pawn will take. And you're left with this isolated pawn. And you have what we call a an extra pawn island that you don't want to have. Generally, you want to have as few pawn islands, pawns that are not connected to other pawns as possible. So that's why he plays b3. We're going to move forward here. Okay, so black plays c6. And now we have another kind of critical moment where Jan made a decision here uh, that was that was criticized by our commentators, Peter Zvedler, Yasser Sarawan here, and he took on c6. So it's interesting. Um, there were the moves that you know Jan and Yas uh, sorry uh, Peter and Yasser were thinking about were moves like Queen B2 or Queen D2 that keep the tension in the center and if Black takes you know we take back and then eventually maybe we'll push the Queen back the Queen on B2 seems well positioned for potential ideas with Knight takes E5 at some point or maybe just some kind of Knight D2 F4 down the road uh, if we can break that pin this pin um, so. So yeah, queen b2 was a possible move, but Jan decides to take on c6. And now what was interesting, so it, it leads to a different, completely different style of position here, um, especially after black takes with the b pawn. And so now we have a position where this pawn on d6 is uh, a backwards pawn that it, that is on a half open file. So black, white is going to have to, is going to be able to put pressure on it. Um, and... And on the other hand, you know, black opens up the B, the B file and also controls the D5 square very well, which if you take with a piece, then the D5 square is weak, sort of similarly to as we get as we get in Sicilian type positions like the Sicilian Zveshnikov, some variations of the Nidorf. So, but it was definitely interesting. And I think Yasser was saying that he would have recaptured, at least his natural instinct would be to recapture with the knight, um, where now there's a weak D5 square, but it's compensated by a weak D4 square uh, that black has. And Maybe black will play a plan like bishop b6, bring their knight to d7. It does look like a fairly reasonable position for, for, for black. Of course, nothing wrong with white's position really either. He'll probably play queen, e, queen to d2, rook to d1, try to put pressure on here while keeping control. Also, maybe this knight will get recycled to try to control the d5 square. So this would have been a totally different type of position. But after b takes, it does feel like, like black is a little passive here. And we'll see the next few moves. Um, the queen gets pushed back and we already see the weakness of this pawn. There's also all the, these ideas with c4, c5 in the air, weakening the e5 pawn. And it's it seems like a difficult position for black to play. Um, so it's, it's quite possible that the move that Yasser, like knight takes c6, was a better option. So here black decides that they don't want to wait passively anymore and they play c5. Um, this is mostly because white was already really threatening to put pressure on this d6 pawn with rook to d1, and it becomes quite awkward. You don't really want to be forced to go back and play knight c8, just very passive. So he decides to play c5, um, and now he hopes that he can get some counterplay. Um, that being said, you know it does give white a pass pawn, and it doesn't entirely solve the problem that this pawn is, is, uh, is backwards on d6. So he plays rook to d8. Bishop e2, uh, the idea of it is to bring the knight back around as he does now. And so now we have a, a little bit of a, 
a little bit, bit of a waiting game. Both sides uh, are making sort of slight improvements in their position, but there's no immediate breakthrough until a few moves later. And this is the reason why this is the game of the day is that the, we get to a really exciting moment here. Um, so in this position, white is understandably trying to trade this bishop. It, it wouldn't be so easy, even if black, let's say last move, they could have tried to play a move like rook a7 with the idea that if we play bishop g4, the bishop could potentially move away. Turns out that this position is not that easy because white is always going to have an idea of giving that bishop up for the knight. Um, and, and there's still a lot of pressure on the d6 pawn, and it's not so obvious what black is going to do on the a file uh, to make progress. So even though that was possible, it's not clear that it was better. Uh, but here the bishops get traded, and uh, it's possible that the move queen to a8 was a mistake because now Jan uh, finds a beautiful way to continue. And this is this is really, this is one of the nicer things I've seen in this tournament so far. He plays g5. So um, the idea of this move really is connected with the next move, which is a peace sacrifice. Uh, it's, and the idea is to crack, crack open the king side so that the pieces can attack. You can see that the black pieces, all of them, are actually on the queen side. So there's not a single piece of blacks on the king side, which means that the king is kind of left alone, right? So it seems like the king on the face of it is safe because there's so, uh, he's got pawns and there's not really any immediate threats to it. But after g5, that really changes. Um, so black takes the pawn on g5. Queen takes e4 was another possibility. I don't want to go too, too, uh, too, too much into the details here. But after the king comes out to f6, white has a few interesting attacking possibilities that seem to give him um, a lot of play, if not an outright winning position. Uh, the first one that I'll mention is f4. And this one exploits the, pi the pin on the e pawn, the pawn can't take. And if the queen takes, then we have either rook f2 or rook f1 pinning the queen, which wins. Um, so f4 is an interesting move, which creates ideas like pawn takes e5 and also ideas like knight to g4 or pawn takes e5 followed by knight g4. Uh, and note that if the knight ever takes on c4, there's like ideas with knight to d5. And so this gets really complicated. It's not actually a simple position at all. Um, but on kick, on uh, queen takes e4 immediately, the other one is we could look at knight to f3, which is uh, the knight was under attack there. So it makes sense to move it away. And the knight now puts pressure against the e5 pawn, again, with all these ideas with knight g4 and forks. So that would have been interesting as well. Um, but Artemyev plays the, understandably says, you know what, I'll at least take a pawn so that that pawn still stays near my king. And now Jan plays knight to f5 check. And really, we just got to look at variations here to, to see how this sacrifice works out. But it is very strong. Pawn takes. Black is essentially forced to take it, right? If they don't take it, um, then simply knight takes d6. And everything collapses without actually being down any material. This pawn is going to fall too. And the black king is still essentially defenseless. So, so he plays uh, pawn takes f5. Knight takes. King to g8. Um, the move king f8 was also possible. And, but it doesn't really change too much. White would play a move like queen e3 with the idea of taking on g5, and the variations are similar to the game. So he plays king g8. Now Jan plays queen to g3. And so what does white have for a piece? Well, the first thing is that they have this wonderful duo of queen and knight, which are considered probably the best attacking duo that you can get. The knight is the only piece that does something that a queen can't do, so it makes sense that they can be good friends in an attack. Um, and... Really, the best way to, 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 to look at this here is to continue because black plays queen takes e4, which is the most logical move. It doesn't only take a pawn. The idea of the move is that it also brings uh, a big, you know, useful piece to the defense of the king. Queen takes g5, king f7. No, king h8 wouldn't work because we play queen f6, king g8, knight h6 mate. This is a nice pattern to remember. So he plays king to f7. Uh, yeah, king f8 would be similar, actually. King f8 is a little bit worse because we can play, we have the extra option of playing queen to f6. So it's actually worse. So king to f7. Um, and now Jan played a very logical move, rook to d3. And it's a beautiful idea. He's trying to bring the rook to f3. We call this a rook lift, bringing sort of one more uh, big, uh, big powerful piece into the attack. 
Unfortunately for him, it was actually a little bit of a mistake. He did have a couple of ways to win here, and they are really beautiful and worth worth seeing. So the first one, which was pointed out, uh, which was pointed out in our chat, is a bit more of a computer-like variation. It's always nice when you sacrifice a piece and then you see the computer validates your play. But this one was pretty hard to find. The second one, I think, might be a little bit uh, more human. But let's take a look at both. So the first one and the strongest is queen to g7. That move, of course, would be considered by human. Now we have two moves to look at: king to e8, which uh, king to e8 just gets mated by queen g8. That one is is easy. And then king e6 is the second one. And so now uh, now we have to be careful with white. The queen g8 check is not as good because black can simply take the knight and they are okay here. Uh, however. White has queen to h6 check. King takes f5, and this looks similar, but the difference is that here the king is cut off, and this is very important. And so because the king is cut off, we have a, we are able to create a little mating net here. Now, note black is up two knights here, so you have to do something quickly because it's a that's a whole lot of material. But the move is f3. This move does two things. It attacks the queen, but the even bigger idea is that we have g4, which is basically checkmate, or forces the, the queen to sacrifice itself. Uh, and there's no, there's simply no defense here. So, you, But, you know, a human seeing a move f3 is really hard because you're looking for checks. You're looking for moves that threaten checks, and that move is just not, it just doesn't come across very easily, I think, to uh, to the human mind. But to the computer, of course, computer finds that in, in, uh, in an instant. So that move would have won. Um, so that was queen g7 check. The other way was uh, to play g4. And so um, g4, sorry, here is a is, is sort of a similar idea. The idea is that we're defending the knight so that when we play queen h6, the knight, um, the king won't be able to take the knight. And so our threat now is to play queen g7 and there's not a lot of moves. So let's look, first of all, let's say black just says, you know, I don't see your threat. What are you gonna do? Well, we play queen g7, king to e6 queen h6, king to f7. And now the difference is that we can take this pawn. And what this does is it's not just a pawn. The idea is that we're clearing the g6 square for the queen. So uh, now we play, let's say, king f6. And now our queen is able to make progress. Queen to g7. We can never go to e8 because of queen g8 mate. And here it's mate. So that's the idea of g4. By defending the knight, we're creating these mating threats. Um, so sorry. So after g4, uh, the other move, the best move, actually, the toughest one is queen takes c4. And now you have to be pretty precise. The, the point of queen takes c4 is that the queen, in a lot of cases, uh, stops queen g8. So it's harder to checkmate. So here we have to be more tricky. Um, queen to g8. Now, if we play rook to f7, the difference is that here we have rook takes d6. And that's a difference. With If the knight was on c4, that wouldn't work because the knight would defend it. But here it's checkmate. So that's the nuance here. Queen g8 is very strong. We play king f6. And again, this is now this one is pretty tricky, actually. The move that wins is rook takes d6. And again, a beautiful variation. Uh, if knight takes d6, rook takes d6, rook takes d6, queen g7 check. You can see that the king is already kind of running out of squares. King e6, queen e7, king d5. Uh, but yeah, and this is this is actually quite tricky. The right move is queen to f7. We also have this idea with knight e3, which wins uh, wins material. And so here, um, black is forced. Well, if you play king e4, there's this, which is a nice fork. So there's rook e6, and then on rook e6, there's queen b7 mate. So again, not not easy at all to find. The move that Jan played is is so incredibly natural. Rook to d3. It is just a pity that it doesn't quite win because our Timiev now finds an amazing defense. And if you have, if you have a second here, pause the video, see if you can find uh, find the defense. Rook to a1, beautiful move. Uh, the idea is that he's he's forcing the rook to move. After which he's able to take this piece, so the the rook does not have time to get into play. Uh, and now, amazingly enough, uh, I wasn't able to find a win for for white it's uh you know they've got these checks but it doesn't seem to quite work here you know if queen h6 uh the king takes and and we we're not quite there right look because a rook f3 we can simply take and now that's too many pieces white is only going to be left with a queen a lone queen not quite enough right to checkmate with just a lone queen so 
Um, so yeah, so I don't see I don't see anything here that wins. There's a lot of ways to 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 make a bunch of checks, and a lot of them lead to perpetuals. Um, Jan plays rook takes a1, queen takes d3. And now he plays rook a3, sort of decides that he's got a he's got a bail here. And so this is a, a nice move because it deflects the queen away from the defense of the king. Uh, and black doesn't have much of a choice because if given the opportunity, white will play rook f3, they'll only be down a piece. So black has to take it. And now knight h6, king e, king e8. Uh, king e8 or king e6 are the same. Queen g8, king e7, queen g5, king e6. Queen f5, and now um, after king e7, the game would end in a draw with queen g5, a perpetual here. The king cannot escape, and white does not have any ways to checkmate. However, an amazing thing happened here, uh, very unfortunate for Artemyev in this first game of the match. He got disconnected and could not reconnect in time, and in this event, um, the, the policy is that if you get disconnected, uh, you have to reconnect in time. Otherwise, you're basically your clock continues to tick. And that's because it's it's very hard to monitor, you know, with these games at this speed. We don't want to give anyone a chance to have extra time to think in complicated positions. And so for that reason, we have a, a, a pretty strict policy. But it, I think it makes sense because, you know, what can you do if if uh, it's completely different if someone could get, you know, two minutes to think about a position uh, when they only have seconds left on their clock as they had here. So unfortunately, Artemyev here lost on time. However, maybe it's poetic justice because with that beautiful peace sacrifice, I feel like a victory for white is certainly not undeserved. So I hope you enjoyed this game of the day and I will see you all tomorrow.